Good evening to everyone gathered here today. Um, firstly, thank you to the IFF team for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here with my co-panelists for this session. I've been asked to talk about health data privacy and patient autonomy in digital India. Now, when we think about health data, we normally think about our treatment plans, medications, test reports, prescriptions, basically information that typically a healthcare provider will collect from us. However, the ambit of health data is much wider. It includes any data related to our health conditions, reproductive outcome, causes of death, and quality of life. For example, my sexual orientation, my fingerprints, facial image, my DNA, um, the time of the day when I took my medication, the steps I covered in a day, the hours I slept, all of this is also part of my health data. It is data that comprises some of the most intimate details of an individual's life. And in this digital world today, we are constantly sharing and resharing this information on the internet with sources within and outside the health system. So what happens if this data gets exposed? At an individual level, it can have a huge impact on a person's sense of well-being, mental health, relationships, work life, and access to healthcare. So for example, a person living with HIV may be at increased risk of losing his job because of uh, the stigma attached to his leaked health status. Insurers in India, as we saw in 2021, were using COVID test results that were being sold on the dark web to charge higher premiums and deny claims of their consumers. At a society level, these kind of practices only exacerbate existing inequalities in access to health services and the stigma and discrimination faced by marginalized populations. This apart, health information, especially when combined with other sources of data, can be used to target particular communities and groups of people having implications much larger than privacy. For one, this information can be used for mass surveillance and profiling. So in 2021, um, the chief medical officer of a district in Jammu and Kashmir was found to be sharing Arogya Setu data with the police there. Um, and this, this harm is not only, uh, you know, limited to, uh, common, to the common man, but it can also extend to people living in authority. Um, so, for instance, there were concerns about the safety of politicians who were treated at AIMS, um, including several prime ministers, in the aftermath of the 2021 cyber attack at the institution. And all this is before I have even come to the harm it causes to the health system itself, which can range from complete disruption of healthcare and patient services, as we saw during the AIMS cyber attack, to the erosion of public trust in the system itself. If people are not sure about the safety of their data, they will be reluctant to share correct and accurate information about themselves, participate in public health programs, screenings, research studies, follow health advisories, or even access health services when they really need it. All of this harms the public health objective of the government and the society as a whole. And it is for these reasons that health data in many countries is treated as sensitive personal data that requires extra security. Till now, India's Information Technology Act, as well as early versions of the data protection bill when it was still being discussed, also accorded the same status. But the Digital Personal Data Protection Act has removed this distinction, putting health data at par with other personal data. In other words, no extra safeguards. So for example, under the IT Act till now, corporations dealing with health data were required to audit their security practices at least once a year. Now these entities, unless designated as significant data fiduciaries, will no longer need to conduct annual audits. Previous versions of the Data Protection Bill also stipulated other conditions, for instance, specific opt-in consent for processing of sensitive personal data, prohibition of its use for employment purposes, and so on and so forth. None of these safeguards are available for your personal health data under the uh, enacted law. 
And apart from uh, demoting the status of health data, the DPDPA also gives individuals very little control over the how their uh, personal health data is used. And I'll give you three examples to illustrate my point. To begin with, the DPDPA does not require public and private entities to provide adequate information to individuals to make an informed dis uh, decision on whether or not to share or permit processing of their personal information. For example, um, data fiduciaries are not required to tell you the third parties that they will be sharing your data with or the duration for which they will be storing your data. So last year, uh, a study by the Center for Internet and Society and Privacy International found nine digital health apps in India were sharing their users' sensitive information with big tech companies such as Facebook and Google, companies which are known to use this data for targeted digital advertising and profiling. The Center for Health Equity and Law, uh, Health Equity Law and Policy, will also be releasing a similar study on telehealth apps in the next couple of months. But just to give you a snippet, during our research, we found that Telemanus, uh, the government's mental health app, does not even have a privacy policy, much less informing its users about its data sharing practices. And all this is just the tip of the iceberg. We have no idea about the plethora of telemedicine apps, e-pharmacies, diagnostic and therapy chatbots, period tracking apps, etc. that have mushroomed in the country. And the data protection law maintains this status quo. Another problematic aspect is that the law allows the government and private entities to process personal data of individuals without their express consent during several circumstances such as accessing public health services during medical emergencies, disasters, disease outbreaks, epidemics, or any threat to public health. Not only are these circumstances not defined under the DPDPA, the blanket exemptions are not in consonance with the principles of proportionality and necessity as laid under the Puttaswamy case and the more recent COVID vaccine mandate judgment where the Supreme Court held that the existence of a health emergency does not in itself dispense the government's duty to respect an individual's autonomy and privacy. In that case, the government was required to justify the negation of consent for receiving a, max, uh, a vaccine um, was the least um, restrictive and proportionate measure. The DPDPA also does not provide crucial um, rights to individuals, um, you know, including the right to data portability, uh, which empowers individuals to transfer their data from one entity to the other with ease and security in case they see any kind of exploitative practices or for any other reason. It does not include the right to be informed about, um, about being subjected to profiling and automated decision making. Um, you know, so for instance, I will never know if my health insurance claim has been denied by an algorithm and I, if, if I don't know what recourse can I take. The DPDPA also does not recognize the right to be compensated for the misuse or breach of data. And to top it all, it imposes duties to deter individuals from using whatever little digital rights that they have. And it is at the back of these weak privacy and security provisions and watered down autonomy that the Indian government is aggressively pushing for a digital shift in the Indian health sector through a program known as the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission. So we now have a digital health identification known as the Ayush uh, Ayushman Bharat Health Account. These, uh, this account will now be attached to our digitized health records. We had digital contact tracing through our Rogya Setu and COVID vaccine management through COVID. Both the apps have now been repurposed. We have an increasing number of public-private partnerships for health data management and digital remote health services. We have the national telemedicine platform in e Sanjeevni, a national telemental health platform in Telemanus, and we are now developing the unified health in, uh, interface where all stakeholders across different platforms can seamlessly interact with each other. So there's a lot going on and there will be a lot more, but unfortunately, all of this is developing under a weak legal re regime, lack of health system preparedness and disempowered people. And so how is this playing out in practice? I'll just point out a few instances. We have ABHA cards that are being 
automatically created for anyone who's accessing public health facilities or using public health insurance programs such as the central government health scheme. While the program, uh, the uh, Ayushman Bhar Digital Health Mission stipulates that use of Aadhaar is voluntary in practice, Abha cards are inevitably getting ring, uh, linked with Aadhaar cards because that is the only option presented on many platforms. And even on the ABDM website, the other option is limited to a driver's license. We are seeing instances where health apps are collecting your data for one purpose and using it for another. Health apps themselves are getting repurposed altogether without any need for taking fresh uh, consent of users for processing their data, as we saw in the case of Arogya Setu and COVID. We are seeing frequent cyber attacks on healthcare in institutions such as AIMS and Safdarjung hospitals, as well as health management systems such as the ICMR and COVID databases. We are seeing increasing number of engagements between the government and technology for some or the other digital health service, contracts or sorry, partnerships which use public resources, handle sensitive personal data and provide critical services. But these, uh, you know, these partnerships re remain uh, shrouded in mystery. At my organization, um, we have been using the RTI Act to get more information on them. Unfortunately, we have been stonewalled by several public authorities who either claim some exemption, keep transferring our application, or simply state no information available despite being the nodal ministry. However, we did find some degree of success at the level of the Central Information Commissioner. So for example, we found out that the partnership between the Indian government and Amazon Web Services for running eSanjeevni did not have any contract or other document setting out the terms of engagement. We are also seeing the increasing use of AI for health, and which also brings forth many questions related to uh, consent, patient safety, bias, liability, and accountability. So these are just some examples of what is happening in the digital sphere in India. And while all of this is underway, the Indian government, along with the World Health Organization, recently launched the Global Initiative on Digital Health 2024 seeking to influence digital health transformation in other developing country. The government has also gone on several international forums, such as the recently concluded World Health Assembly promoting platforms such as COVID as digital public infrastructure. In my view, however, the need of the R is for the government to focus on organizing its own house before anything else. Thank you.